Welcome to the Mary Greeley Primetime Alive presentation, Staying Independent, Know Your Options. I'm Vicki Newell. I manage the Primetime Alive program here at Mary Greeley Medical Center. As a reminder, if you'd like more information about Primetime Alive or to sign up for a program or to join Primetime Alive, you can go to mgmc.org slash PTA. All right, our pre presenter today is Crystal Doig. Crystal has more than 28 years experience serving and empowering people in various capacities. She earned her BA in social work from the University of Montana and is a certified aging and and is certified in aging and geriatrics from Boston University, a certified information referral specialist in aging and disability and a certified options counselor. She has worked at Aging Resources for more than 15 years in multiple positions, including case manager, lead case manager, family caregiver specialist, and as the elder rights specialist advocate. Prior to her work at Aging Resources, Crystal had worked as a home supervisor and volunteer mentoring director in the field of disabilities and aging in Napa, Salona County, Area Agency on Aging. Crystal currently supervises the Elder Abuse Prevention and Awareness and Family Caregiver Programs at Aging Resources. Please welcome Crystal. Well, hello. It's really glad to be here. Can everybody hear me? Great. Well, it's really, I'm really glad to be here. I'm here to talk about staying independent, knowing your options. So in full disclosure, my supervisor was supposed to be here. So I'm, I'm like the JV. You get me today. So she's in Florida, which how nice would that be? You know, so I'm here doing her presentation and she's in Florida on a beach somewhere. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, like she said, I work at Aging Resources of Central Iowa. We cover, um, Story County as well. So we have a mere Period of programs and services through the Area Agency on Aging. If by some means I trip up and say um, AAA, I don't mean the Auto Club. I actually mean the Area Agency on Aging. Okay. So again, we'll get going and uh, I'm open to questions at the end. So here we go. So challenges in aging. I think we all can name a few on our own what those might be. Um, dealing with changes in our health and our mobility. Uh, I just recently, I don't know what I did. I went for a walk. I don't know how I did it, but I've injured my foot to the point where I couldn't walk for a few days and you don't realize how much you need your feet or your toe. That's really what it is. I have a broken toe. So you don't realize how much something that small can impact your mobility. So changes in your health and your ability um, make it challenges for aging and where we're going to age. Loss of our support systems. Um, maybe uh, our children don't live close by. We've moved into a new area where we don't have as many family and friends around us. Um, those types of things that, uh, that happen are we, we had to move because we had changes in our health and challenges. So we had to move someplace else where we don't have those support systems or we live on a fixed income. Um, I do a lot of presentations on elder abuse and I'll tell you guys, um, fixed incomes that it's, you all have a fixed income or a somewhat fixed income. When I'm talking about financial exploitation, one of the things I always share is, um, Willie Sutton, do you all remember Willie Sutton? He used to rob banks back in the day. And he, they asked him one time, well, why do you rob banks, Willie? He said, well, that's where the money is. That's where the money is. It's in our older America, it's our older Americans who have the money and the scammers and people know where to go. So a lot of us live on a fixed income. That's a continued income that's coming in. And we then we have unexpected medical expenses and the list can go on and on. And I'm sure you all could fill in the blank. I have this or I have that or my loved one has this or I'm taking care of so and so and it's impacting my ability to care for myself. So Aging Resources, the new and improved. So technically, Aging Resources, um, you may know us as the experts on aging. You may recognize that we've been around for nearly 50 years. Um, so we are created in 1968 by President Johnston through the Older Americans Act. Um, so we get a lot of our funding through the Older Americans Act. But so we've been around since 1973. You may recall that we serve older adults and their caregivers. And you may be familiar with the fact that we serve eight counties, central Iowa, so we serve Polk County and all the counties that touch Polk. You may remember that we help fund 
home-based services in central Iowa. So what you may not know is, here, here's a breakdown of all the area agencies on aging in the state of Iowa. There are six of them. And so we are right smack there in the center. So they are broken down by population. So I'm really blessed in the fact that I work in central Iowa and I don't work for Elderbridge. Not that Elderbridge is not a great place to work. It's just a lot of travel. So we, it is broken down by, um, again, population. If someone needed to reach another triple A in another area, you could call area, you could call aging resources and we could get you there, get you to the right program. So Aging Resources is also a disability resource center. So we also work with people between the ages of 50, uh, between the ages of 18 and 59 with a disability. We don't require proof of that disability. We just ask, do you have a disability? And we take people at their word. So that became effective in, I think, 2011 or 2014. Who does Aging Resources serve? An information resource center for individuals who, I can kind of jump the gun here, is for the aging, anybody over the age of 60 with or without a disability, individuals living with a disability, and caregivers. So we provide help to people that are caring for a loved one. So we have any age of a loved one. So you can give us a call. And we, so in that situation, the caregiver is actually the client. But we're actually serving both. By serving the caregiver, we're helping with resources and services to meet the needs of the person they're caring for. Aging Resources provides one place to call for services, which is a great place. So I always say when people call us, they ask questions, and we can refer to multiple programs within our own agency. So team, we have a team of ex, uh, experts to assist you in learning about resources to help you stay in your home. So all when you call in, all of our services are person-centered, which means basically you're driving the train. You're telling us what's going on in your life and what you're wanting information about or what the concern is or problem might be. And then we may provide you with several different options. We're not going to tell you which options to choose or take, but we'll provide you with those options and you go from there. Uh, at that point, if something doesn't work, you can always call us back and we'll continue to talk about different options that maybe that one didn't work. Why didn't it work? Was it, why wasn't it a good fit? Maybe it just simply wasn't a good fit and there's no reason for it. And then we can help move you to a different option. The team of experts. So here is our team of experts. So we have the information referral assistant specialist. They typically are the people that are gonna, um, I should, I, let me back up. Before COVID, we all, I hate that we have to say that now, but before COVID, there was always a live person that answered our phone. Now that we primarily work from our homes because we do home visits, so you go into a call queue and we will call you back. I will tell you, we call you back within that day. It has to be something going on in our office for us not to get you called right back. And I say that because there are times when things do happen where our phones blow up once in a while, so we may be a day behind, but it's usually within, it's within a 48 hour, 24 hour period that we're calling you back. All of the staff at our office are what they called options counselor certified. So what that really means is we're not counselors or in any stretch of the imagination, we're not gonna do therapy or anything like that. We provide options to whatever, like I said, your problems, your issues, your concerns, or services you want. So when you call in to information and referral, we're gonna give you the information you're looking for. If it seems like you may not be able to get to those options or struggling with those options for whatever reason, and you need a little extra support in getting connected to those, those services, then we would refer you to an options counselor who would make those referrals for you, make sure you get connected, and be with you through that process for 90 days, okay? And, and checking in with you frequently to make sure that what we talked about in the options counseling sessions is meeting your needs and if nothing else has popped up. They may ask you to prioritize what your services are or what your needs are so we can tackle them first. If for some reason, it's not listed here, but for some reason you need a little bit more help than that 90 day window can provide, then we would refer you to a case manager within our agency who can then be with you a little bit longer and help get you connected. And a lot of times we help with people to apply for Medicaid or any other benefit programs. 
So when you first call in, you guys probably won't know this when you call in, but when you first call in, we're asking questions, trying to gain other information about what other services and programs and benefits could we connect you with, you or your family, by just ask, just talking with you. So then it moves into options counseling once you can't, if you have trouble getting connected to those services. Beyond the options counseling, then comes case management. And that's a long term, more like a six month window. So we do a lot of help with, again, helping people fill out applications. Uh, we help with um, benefit programs such as Medicaid. So if somebody, for example, was applying for a Medicaid elderly waiver program, that is a program that brings services whoops, services to your home. So through the Medicaid program, and it's paid through Medicaid, that can take about six months to get on that program. So we're going to have somebody in there to be present to help connect you to make sure you get on that program. But also, if there's service need during that six months, then we're going to look around how can we find to fill the gap of that service need for that six-month window. We have family caregiver specialists or consultants. Those are um, individuals dedicated to working with caregivers who are providing care to an adult, loved one, dis a disabled child, um, a, a, a spouse, uh, a sister, a brother, and anybody could be a caregiver. And we use the word family pretty loosely at our office because Maybe you don't have any immediate family helping you, but maybe your neighbor's the one that gets your groceries every week or supports you by calling and checking on you. We might be able to connect them as a family uh, support for you. Why we'd use that is because we have a little bit of funding for the family caregiver program that we can help pay for things through that program. There's, there's a little bit more money in there. Um, and then we have the elder rights specialist, and that's primary my function at the office, even though I supervise the family caregiver program, so I guess I'm a family caregiver specialist as well. But elder rights, so I deal with a lot of elder abuse and prevention. So I go out and do a lot of speaking on elder abuse, but I also help clients or people that are being uh, victimized or experienced elder abuse. So when we talk about elder abuse, um, that's kind of the catch-all for abuse for the older adults, but in the state of Iowa, when you want to make an adult protective report, or call Department of Human Services to report some abuse going on to an older adult in your community, they will ask you, is there a caretaker involved? Are they dependent on that caretaker? If they're not dependent, then they won't accept the call or investigate that situation. So their abuse probably is still happening, but because you can't make the argument or they're not dependent on the person, then they won't accept the call. So they're supposed to tell you to call somebody like me at an area agency on aging and ask to speak to an elder rights specialist. So then we will reach out to the to you and talk with you, but we'll try to reach out to the older adult who's being experiencing the abuse and try to mitigate the abuse. A lot of times, older adults don't want to report the abuse because 95% of the time, it's a family member who's doing the abuse, and it's usually financial exploitation is the number one call that we get at our office. Remember when I said, where's the money? You all have the money. So that's why it's, especially since COVID, people lost their jobs, they moved back in with mom and dad, and they haven't moved out. So we talk about mediation where we'll have a family meeting and talk about what are some of our options. And then if needed, we can make a police report with them or we can go to court and take out a petition for relief of elder abuse. And we'll go through the uh, program with them as well, uh, the court process with them. We have nutrition, nutrition managers. Um, we fund a lot of home delivered meals program and senior centers through our agency. We also have a dietitian on staff. So if there's somebody who wants to meet with her, that's a one time free consultation. So if you have a new diagnosis or you need help just getting ideas for the grocery, for going to the grocery store, she's available. So you can call our office and ask to speak with Stephanie. She is a full time dietitian on our staff. We have care coordinators that help you move through the systems and explain systems to you, like what's going to happen now, like a newly diagnosed dementia, maybe we would talk and provide education around that as well. Um, we provide information for decision making that primarily falls in my world as an elder rights specialist. How does, what does that look like? Um, what are, what are some options for decision making, such as power of attorney? Um, guardianship, conservatorship, if that's something that's needed, we talk about that. 
we assist in creating plans for now and the future. So that's one thing we're going to talk about. When you call in, no matter when you call in, we're going to help with the immediate call and the immediate problem. But we're also going to talk about what's the long-term plan. Okay, so maybe you're a caregiver for someone and you're calling in and you need respite because you're really stressed and burnt out. So we're going to put in some in-home respite for you to get a break. But we're going to talk to you about what's going to happen in six months. This is kind of a band-aid. We're here, so let's make a plan. Or let's look at the overall financial situation. We're not financial planners, but we talk about that in the fact that moving forward, and maybe you need to talk to a financial planner about what you want to do and how you want to be treated and cared for moving forward. Um, we, we facilitate family decision-making. So a lot of times we get families who have uh, older parents who have maybe five, six, seven children, and they all have their own opinion on what should happen with mom and dad and how they should be cared for. So those are really fun, I must say. Those are my favorite things to do. So we, we sit down and we have a conversation. Basically, as my mom would say, lay all the cards on the table. Because what we learned or what I have learned, older people want to keep their independence as long as possible. And they're in charge and they're still mom and dad. Children often just want to make sure mom and dad are okay and safe. If that means we can put them in an assisted living or in a nursing home, at least we know they're taken care of and they're okay. But that might not be the best option for everybody. So we talk about what those options are and how can we compromise. What kind of services can we put in there to keep them in their home? One of the goals of the Area Agency on Aging is to keep people in their homes as long as possible, as safe as they are able to be, to be safe as long as possible. So again, we link to community service providers. We work a lot with different providers in our communities. We have good relationships with them. Um, we pay for some, some services through our community providers. So we can help get you connected to those providers as well as, as provide you information on those providers. We can't recommend anybody to you because that would be against, against the rules for us, but we can provide you information. Okay. Now it's not. Now it's not moving. <laughs> there we go. So home and community based services. So we. Th that's kind of what I just said. We want to maintain people in their home as independent and as safely as possible. And one of the things we talk about, if it's about bringing somebody in to help do the laundry and do some cleaning, and you can still stay in your home, I think it's worth it. So we talk about that. A lot of people don't want anybody coming into their home. It's their private home or they don't want to give up the independence of that. But if the option is I'm going to stay in my home and have someone come in once a week or I'm going to go to an assisted living, which assisted livings are nice, and, or a nursing home, but I think most people would rather stay in their home. So some of the community-based services that we can connect you with are listed here. I won't go through all of them, but if you can, as you can see, there, it's quite extensive list of services and providers that we could connect you with. The other thing I want to mention, when we do help people apply for the Medicaid elderly waiver program, these services are paid for, the bulk share of these services, I should say, are paid for through the Medicaid program to keep people in their home. So we help people get on that program or help with that application. It's like a 31-page application, and that seems daunting and scary to people, but really it's not. It's not even that long, okay? We, most of it, we leave blank, to be honest with you. So we can talk with you about what that looks like, and a lot of times we advocate with you and maybe to your doctor. We can advocate to the services. We can advocate with the court. Um, so basically, we're your cheerleader So <laughs> to try to help you get connected to the services that you want and need. Again, this is the eligibility requirements to be on that Medicaid elderly waiver program. You have to be 65 years of age. You have to meet medical need for the program. So when they talk about medical need, they will send an assessor out to your house to ask you a lot of questions and will be there for about two hours. <laughs> The, the main thing that they're looking for, can you bait, I'm sorry, 
I thought somebody talked. Um, the main thing they're looking for is to see if you can bathe and dress yourself safely. Okay? That doesn't mean you need to have full help with bathing and dressing, like somebody in your bathroom helping you do your shower. What that means is maybe you're not steady and you're a fall risk, and so maybe you only take a shower when your daughter's at your house and she's doing the laundry or she's doing the dishes in the other room, but that's the only time you feel comfortable stay, taking a shower. That's called supervised or standby assistance. So that's bathing and dressing help, okay? Um, or if you have a cognitive issue where you need help with supervision, cueing, reminders, stuff like that. You can still do all your personal cares, but you need reminders to do so. So that would make you, that would also qualify you on medical need. This is, then you have to meet the other part. So it's two parts. You have to meet medical need for that program, and then you have to meet financial need for that program. So this is outdated. It is now $2,700 a month income to be on this program. So if it's a married couple, they only look at the person that's applying for Medicaid, their income only, okay? So the person that's applying for that Medicaid elderly waiver has to make less than $2,700 a month. But it, they look at your resources together. So resources for an individual who's not married, who is applying for Medicaid, they cannot have more than $2,000 in the bank. That includes stocks, bonds, annuities, 401k, a life insurance policy with a cash value of more than $2,000. It also looks at um, additional properties and resources. So you can have, it's a, it'll exempt your house, so your house does not count against you, and it exempts one vehicle. So you can still drive and do stuff like that and be independent and be on this program. Um, but for a married couple, it gets a little bit more confusing and I don't want to confuse anybody. So if it's a married couple, I would encourage you really to call our office because a bulk share of the resources that a married couple have can be attributed to the spouse that is not applying for Medicaid, okay? And we could talk you through that. Um, the spousal impoverishment rules apply right there. That's kind of what I was leading into. Um, a couple... The spouse, the community spouse, if, a, if the other one on Medicaid has to go into the nursing home and is on Medicaid and is on facility Medicaid, the government will not impoverish the spouse that's not in the nursing home. So if their income is less than what the person in the nursing home's Social Security is, they will get their Social Security, the person that's in the nursing home. Typically, unfortunately... Up until this point, men have always made more money. So the man's in the the man's in the nursing home. I'm working with a client right now. Her husband's in the nursing home. She gets four hundred and ninety one dollars in Social Security. She cannot live on four hundred and ninety one dollars in Social Security. So we've applied for spousal impoverishment, spouse, and so now her Social Security has been brought up. It's his Social Security, which is about two thousand dollars a month, which she can she can maintain her her lifestyle on that. So that's really what that means. It's not going to impoverish somebody who can't maintain without their spouse's income. Um, so the resources, the max is $137,000 is what would be attributed to a, a spouse that's not on Medicaid. The minimum amount would be $2,700,480. The maximum amount a, a spouse can get is $3,435 a month in somebody's Social Security. Okay, so that would be in that situation with the woman who is living on 491. If her husband made $4,000 a month in Social Security, she would only be able to receive 3,443 of that. The rest of it would go to the, the nursing home. Okay? When you might want to call aging resources, if you're planning for your future, we would love it, and I will say this, love it if you could call us before it's a crisis. <laughs> if you're trying to do some pre-planning or prevention, if it's, your, if it's your parents and you just want information and you're doing some research, give us a call. We love those calls. Usually the calls we get are people in a crisis and needing help immediately. And that's fine too. That's why we're here as well. But we would like to get the word out that we can help be preventative as well. Uh, if you are concerned about staying in your home, give us a call. 
that we can talk with you about, maybe it's about home modification stuff that you need happening in your home. Do you need your doors widened? Do you need a walk-in tub? Do you need a ramp? Those types of things. So we can get you connected to the resources to, to do that. There are a couple agencies that will come into the home to do a walkthrough to give you some ideas for home modification if that's something that you need. Um, or we could come in and just talk with you about anything really about your home. Fall, if it's a falling, if it's a, if you're a fall risk, we can talk about that and what other options would be to mitigate some of the falls going on in the home. Or is it just that you need an emergency response button? We have information on those as well and, and how much they cost. Um, if you're caring for someone, an individual's caring, if you are an individual caring for someone, obviously you're a caregiver. Sorry. <coughs> Um, then we can help support you in, <coughs> sorry, talking a lot. Um, do you want to move them in with you? Do we need to do some updating to your home to make that more conducive for them to live with you? Do you want to be a paid caregiver? How do I become a paid caregiver? What programs do I need to qualify for? Um, or is it that you want to <coughs> move them into an assisted living and we can provide information and service uh, information on those assisted livings in your area and what you're looking for and the cost of them and how you could potentially pay for them if you're low income. Aging resources is meeting the needs, <clears throat> meeting the needs. So we always tell people we meet people where they are. So wherever, what's ever going on in your life, we're meeting you right there with no judgment and trying to help you move forward and take the steps you need to obtain what you are looking for. We provide expert information for fostering effective decision making, meaning that's back to that options counseling. We're gonna talk about those options. This could happen, this could happen, this could happen, kind of like down the line. So giving you a full understanding of what the resources are and services and what's expected in those programs and services <clears throat> or with those services offering cost-effective caring services to age in place. So what we tell people, you want to talk to your local area agency on aging because we have a database. Lifelong Links has a database. You can look up Lifelong Links and find information about services and programs uh, for, the, for, the whole, for the whole state. And you can even pare it down to a county if you want to. You could go on to Lifelong Links and look up Story County and look for home care services and, and information will pop up. But what's not on that is the local churches and communities, volunteer programs that we may know about in your area that's just specific, maybe just to Ames or just to Nevada that might be able to meet the needs and services that you have. So we encourage everybody to call and maybe it would be a free service <coughs> to you based on what's going on in your life and what's needed. We design plans for caregiver success. Really want to make sure that the caregiver is supported and it, because really it's a full-time job. A lot of people are working a full-time job and, and doing caregiving in, in addition to that. Um, so we want to really support them with however we can. We coordinate and manage nutrition programs. So we have, you know, the... Um, the farmer's market coupons. I don't know if you all know about that. We have coupons. There are $30 worth of coupons to any farmer's market in the state of Iowa. It is income-based, so it changes every year. So you could call our office and see what the income guidelines are, and they're good from June 1 all the way to the end of October, and they're good at any farmer's market, like I said. And they're only for locally grown fruits and vegetables, jams, holly, and honey. Again, we advocate for our clients with the elder rights specialist. So I'm an elder rights specialist, as well as my coworker, Louise. Um, we typically um, speak to people who are being abused and, and, and voice their voice. We're their advocate in the room, helping them be heard for, being, um, for whatever is going on, whether it's in court, whether it's with their own children, <laughs> with their family, or with service providers. Or if we can't get something we really will go out and do the most we can to get help and services for the, and that might even be across area agency boundaries as far as I might go over to Elderbridge and advocate for some more support there um, if something is needed. <clears throat> so staying independent and knowing your options. I guess I was a little short today. <laughs> so, 
Um, uh, but Kay Vonigs is who put this together, so I wanted to make sure she got credit for this. She put this presentation together. I'm just the, the messenger. So if anybody has questions, I'm glad to answer. And I have the microphone, so please raise your hands and I will come around. Oh. Uh, you said, um, let's see, if you're planning for your future, you love to have people call. What does that entail? What what would at this point so, in our life if we don't need so your we would, services? We would ask, have you thought about your long-term plan? Do you have long-term care insurance? Is that something that you can look into to see what it would pay for? Do you want a list of, nurse, uh, list of assisted livings if that is coming up? If that's something down the line, what's in my area? What is around me? What are some home care agency? What is about the cost of that? And we can talk about those things. What are some services that I could have in my home if that's where I wanted to stay in my home? Could you connect me to a, a, a realtor who specializes for older people selling their homes when it's time to go to a nursing home or downsizing companies, helping people come in and downsize their home. We have a few eight companies uh, that we know of, senior transitions, at home care, stuff like that will come in and walk you through your home and down and talk with you about what do you want to donate? What do you want to have? Do you want to have a tag sale? Do you want to uh, throw away? And what do you want to take with you? All right. Other questions? Is everything on income? No. Our agency is not on income. Uh, we, Medicaid is on income and certain programs are on income that we would know about. So we would be screening for that. So if someone came to me and said, I'm caring for my mom, I have a million dollars in the bank, I'd be, but I don't want to pay for anything. <laughs> that would be a hard conversation, but I might say to you, okay, how about we just try this service? Aging resources will pay for it for the next three months to see if it's beneficial to you. After that three months, you can continue to pay for that services or aging resource, and aging resources will be ending. So sometimes we'll work with people who have resources to, so they can see the benefit of the service, but not everything is income. We will talk to anybody and we will help anyone. Does that answer your question or you want more specific? I want more, more specific. When you say more specific, what, like? I, not as a caregiver, but as myself. If I, I feel like I need help in taking care of my house or, um, oh, like I can't cut my own toenails or anything like that, um, are you going to come and, and go through no. all of my finances or what are you doing? No, I'm not no. <laughs> following this. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. No. We might ask what your finances are to see if you would qualify for some reduced sliding scale fee or free services in your area. And then we could refer you to those services. Depending on your income, you may have to pay for them. Our services at Aging Resources just to call us and talk to us or to consult with us or anything that we do is not is free. But if you have money, we're going to ask about your money, your income, and we'll probably say it like this. Is your income above or below this? We're not going to be specific unless you're going to apply for Medicaid. Then, then it gets a little dicey. We need a specific number. But if you could tell us what your ballpark is, then we could help get you connected to those services and let you know if they would be free based on that information that you're providing on your income or if you would have a sliding scale fee. Like, some places have a sliding scale fee for homemaker services based on income. So you work with everybody no matter income. It's just what you're able to offer them. Correct. Is, is you know, <clears throat> so, they're, yep. Okay. Aging resources is free across, all of our stuff is free, but what we can, we can only offer what's out there. We don't provide direct care service. We're not direct care. We're kind of that connector piece. We connect you with the services and benefit programs that we are aware of. And then based on your income, can share with you the best options for you. 
Okay, so say you're living in your home and you know you're getting older and you're kind of noticing a few things changing, but you're still independent and you're fine in your home. Even though you don't have a like immediate need, it would be beneficial to call you and say, hey, I know, you know, I might have a need down the road. Is it a good time to have you come in? Because you guys might identify some places where you can help them or make suggestions or connect them to services that they may not even be aware of, right? Or right. to be thinking about or preparing for. Right. And probably in that scenario, that would probably be more home home modification or home remodel in some regards. So um, Happy at Home is a company that comes in, will look at your home and give you some ideas for the future. Um, one of the things that uh, I can just tell you right off the top of your head, my head, throw rugs. If you have throw rugs in your home. Throw them away. Throw them away. <laughs> That's why they're called throw rugs, Exactly. Right? <laughs> Get rid of them because they, uh, they are a fall risk for sure. And it, well lit will tell you about, they'll talk to you about lighting. They'll talk to you about those types of things to increase your safety and decrease the fall risk. But Happy at Home would come in and say, well, maybe we need to put some kind of threshold or a, a step up here or, or a railing here, those types of things. Or maybe we need to widen the door um, in the event that you may need a walker and you need to get a walker into a bathroom. People don't think about that. Or a wheelchair into the bathroom. Or maybe it comes too difficult to step over a tub. You can do uh, what they call a transfer bench where you're sitting on one side of the tub and you transfer your bottom across and you get into the shower. Or maybe it's a tub cut. You just cut your tub down and make it into a walk-in shower. So we would have somebody come in. We would refer you to an, a company that could come in and provide you that information. And then you could plan for the future. This is what may be coming down the pike. Maybe you have bad knees. Maybe you're going to get a knee replacement or hip replacement, those types of things. Oh. Maybe they need to get together and uh, do the um, decision making and maybe even some mediation. You're saying there's no charge for that gathering. Correct. So you could just call. Will you, re, will you repeat? Yes. So question? she's asking if she had some fa a group, a family that would needed some family meeting or mediation to come in to get some planning together. There's no cost for that. There's no cost for that. Again, I want to reiterate that we are not attorneys. We're not legal. So we can't so, you know, represent you legally. Um, we would refer you to some attorneys that we would know of in the area. Um, Depending on, that's again another depending on income um, is where we would refer you. Legal hotline for older Iowans is available to anybody over the age of 60. They can answer any, pretty much any questions and provide information to you. But if they are going to represent you, they're going to want to know about your finances because that is um, based on income. And do you, legal hotline, is that what you call it? And that's oh, for yep. people 60 and better. Yep. Do you have a phone number? Oh boy. Um, I'm guessing I could Google it and share it with everybody, but oh, maybe you have something there. I might have something in my phone um, okay. because I call it frequently. I have it. I thought I had it memorized off the top of my head, but I don't want to give a wrong number. So it's 800-992-9900. I will tell you they do not do criminal, <laughs> okay? So if so, you have a criminal issue, they're not going to help you. So don't rob a bank and right, then call right. them. But, All I right. will, but I will tell you this. If you call there, you call them, and they're not able to help you, we would encourage you to say, can you send me a list of uh, attorneys in the area that do these, this particular need that I have? And they will. Um, so a lot of people will call us ahead of time before calling certain places. Like, what do I even need to ask them? What am I asking for? Um, in my, and that, that's a particular good example, legal hotline for older Iowans. Well, you're going to call. You're asking this depending on your need. Maybe you just need a power of attorney or a living will done. That's what you're asking about. They are going to, so you're going to leave a message. They will call you back. And then an attorney, if it's accepted, will call you back and get you started. Okay, um, I get a lot of calls to our office. Is this abuse or not abuse? And we talk about, does an adult protective call need to be made? What is adult protective going to ask me? Then we walk through that, and these are the things you need to be prepared to answer. 
Okay, Tim has two questions sure. from online that he's going to read for us. Okay, first question is, are you familiar with medical transport options if one needs to relocate a medically fragile patient from out of state to Ames? We, we are, but off the top of my head, I could not provide that information to you. I would encourage you to call our office and ask to speak to a family caregiver specialist. Um, it's not cheap. I will be honest about that. That is not a cheap endeavor, but they could provide you with information on who to contact. Okay. And the second question is, are the suggested downsizing companies pre-screened? Yes. Yes. I would call TISA, T-I-S-A, at Senior Transitions. Actually, she's out of Ames, so... All right. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. Um, you mentioned elder abuse, and, um, you know, on the news recently, you know, it's showing what's happening to women who um, either were uh, unaware or didn't know about saving for retirement who are, are on very, very limited income. But what would be some signs to watch for in terms of elder abuse? You mentioned, you know, usually the abuser is a family member, but what would be some signals or red flags that something might be not right? In, related, in, related, in relation to financial exploitation or just elder abuse in general? I'm, I'm guessing financial exploitation is the number one thing that, you know, I personally have heard of in, um, the, that's been encountered by families. So usually if it's financial exploitation, it's talking with the older adult about do they know where their money's going? Are they paying their own bills? Do they know? So if somebody's talking to you, they're coming to you as a friend saying, you know, I just can't make ends meet every month. And you know that they probably have a good income prior to somebody coming back into their life or something happening. Um, if they're not able to meet their needs and they're not able to tell you what their bills are, that's a red flag because that means that information is being withheld from them. So we talk about isolation as the number one red flag for, elder, for all kinds of elder abuse. Isolation from family and friends, you're not being, they're not being seen or heard from, or information is being kept from them, like their financial information, like, mom, I can do that for you. Let me handle your bills. No, I'm quite capable of handling my bills. Well, why don't I just run to the store with you real quick? Or, oh, mom, you don't, I can just go, you can just stay here. And over time, there, there becomes this learned dependency on that where, okay, I'll just do it. And then they just take over. Remember, mom, I do it better or I do it. It's easier for me just to do it without you. And then they start taking a little bit here and there. And that's usually how it starts. It's a little bit here and there or it's a loan and I'll pay you back. And I loaned some money to my daughter. I loaned her $200. She was only able to pay me back $50. So there's that hook of she paid me back. So I'm, I'm probably going to get the rest of that $150. A few months down the road, she may need to borrow $500. You loan it again. You may get 20 bucks back. You may not get anything back. But by the fact that you got something back, you have that hope and you're still considered a loan. It's not a loan. That's financial exploitation. And it's financial exploitation because it's undue influence on an older adult needs to be proven by the sheer fact that it's a family member. You love that person, so they have influence over you. Like, I don't want to get my sons in trouble if they're stealing money from me. I sure as heck don't want my dirty laundry to be aired out in the real world to everybody to see that, well, what kind of mom raised a boy that could steal money from her. So a red flag would be isolation if you're not seeing or hearing from them or if they're telling you they don't know what their finances are or they don't understand where all their money's going, okay? Or if somebody's new in their life, a long lost person shows up. Another thing we see a lot of, and, and I'll get a lot of, is scams. We see a lot of scams. That's a number one call to our office as well as part of financial exploitation. People, romance scams right now are, are huge. Um, and so we talk to a lot of people. We get a lot of calls from children who maybe their mom or dad just got caught up in a romance scam but don't believe it's a scam. And so then we talk about how can we present that um, to them and get them to understand that it's a scam. Usually it's a partnership with the attorney general's office and law enforcement. 
Um, I was just thinking, I know a parent would probably be hesitant to do it, but wouldn't it be better to get in writing if you're doing a loan to a child or to anybody? You know, you say, oh, just as a friend, I'll, get, I'll loan you this money, but get it in writing. Absolutely. We, we tell people to get it in writing no matter what you do. Like if if you it's a gift, you, you could put you can, that in the note. You know, it's a gift. So then right. they would know they don't have to pay it back. But if it says it's a loan. I, 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 I totally agree with you. And I would even go as far as to say we get a lot of calls that um, so-and-so moved in with me. And the plan was they weren't going to pay rent because I, they were going to take care of me. You know, so I don't have to pay for home care. So the trade-off is they get to live here free as long as they help me and take care of me to keep me in my home. Well, you know, down the road, they stop helping and they're there. And then it becomes about eviction, evicting them from that home. And that's a, that's a process unto itself. So then we talk about that. But that right there is financial exploitation of someone's property. They're living with somebody for their house. So, to, in my mind, I have something going on anywhere from financial or health concerns or um, adult daycare options, the whole gamut of anything related to aging or just being an older adult having concerns. You guys are just a great resource because if you don't have a program or service, you most likely have dealt with it and can refer you to the right places. Right. I often say this is a this is a true call. So as an I I got a call one day, I was helping cover INA and the call was, I just bought a jitterbug phone. Can you tell me how it works? I can't figure it out. So I'm quickly Googling how does a jitterbug phone work while I'm on the phone with this individual to the point where I got a call, sadly it was right before Christmas my daughter moved me up here and has kept me locked in the bedroom for three days. Oh. I need help. Can you help me? So that, so we, so yes, we get calls on this light end to very serious calls. And we get calls from caregivers who are just, you know, and there's no judgment. I'm like, I'm at my wit's end. I can't do this anymore. This is too hard. I don't understand. Just on my drive up here, I got a call from a, a daughter whose mom, I think probably has di dementia. She hasn't been diagnosed, but there's been a significant change in the last six months. She's mean, she's aggressive, and she's combative. And she's like, I, I, I took care of my grandma, and she had Alzheimer's, and she was nice, and she was sweet and loving and fun. Why is my mom doing this? Well, then it's about caregiver education. This is this Alzheimer's dementia can present this way as well. We need to talk about getting into the doctor, getting into a neurologist, let's get some medication and some treatment, and then get her to a support group. Do you have or can you refer people uh, to representative payees if they need help with finances? We can provide information on a representative payee if you're talking about through uh, Social Security. Yeah. You would need to start with your doctor. Okay, but if you want like somebody that could do it, somebody else, if if there's an older person who's not handling their finances, and you know about this program, which we do, how do you arrange, or who arranges? So, in for a representative payee through Social Security, needs to start with the doctor. The doctor needs to send a form in to Social Security, stating why they need a rep payee. And then who is going to be that rep payee? Does that answer your question? I mean, we can provide you with um, companies that do it for profit. If that's what you need, we can certainly provide you that information. But for a rep payee, you would need to start with a doctor. Now, I believe Heartland Senior Services used to have yep, provide do. that. Do they still do that? They do. Yep. Okay. And so my guess would be as well, if you called down there and said you need it, they're going to say, okay, this is the first step. And then, and I'm guessing theirs is knowing the kind of services they provide. They're not a for-profit. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Tim, anything else online? Yes, someone said uh, they missed your contact information. Oh, I guess Kay didn't put it on here. <laughs> 
So I will just tell you guys real quick. You can call Aging Resources at 515-255-1310. Um, it's also on the back of those um, brochures. There's an 800 number on the back of those brochures. And I believe the link, uh, lifelong, yeah, exactly. Lifelong links number is on there as well. So how lifelong links works, um, if somebody's calling lifelong links, that eight, I think it's 866 or 867 number, it auto routes you to the right AAA. So it, re, it will recognize the first three digits of your phone number. So if somebody calls and it starts with a 515, it's going to come to our office. If somebody calls and it's a 712, it might go to connections. So it just depends on... But if they don't rec if the phone doesn't recognize the first three digits, then it's you're going to get a person. There's a person that answers the phone. And remember, what does AAA stand for? <laughs> Area Agency on Aging. Yep. So the, remember, there's what six. In there's our six of us. There state. are six of yeah. us. So if anybody needs help getting connected to those, like I said, give us a call. And if anybody is on virtually and they didn't catch the phone number or want other contact information. Feel free to email me. This is Vicki. You all should have my email, and that's how you were able to sign in virtually because you do not have the handout that Crystal just talked about. So please reach out if you need any other information. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank you so much for spending uh, an hour with me. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Crystal. Great information. And um, I always enjoy the information you provide in your presentation, but I love the questions and love hearing because I can guarantee you, I saw one person asking a question, but I saw 10 other people writing down the information that was shared. So we all benefit from hearing from other people. Um, I want to, re oh, you will be getting, I think next week, our listing of programs for April through June, um, but I'll give you a little uh, heads up here. Wednesday, April 12th, we're having a program on living with vision loss, and we're having somebody with the Iowa Department for the Blind coming in and talk about resources available, and that's here in Myers Auditorium, 2 p.m., but also offered virtually. And then Thursday, April 27th, um, this program is actually from 2 to 4 p.m., only offering in person here in Myers Auditorium, getting your ducks in line. This is kind of one of those scenarios of what if you're walking across the street when you leave here and you get hit by a bus? Is everybody in your family or who needs to know where all your documents are and all your information and all of that? It's helping you pull all of that together, having that peace of mind of knowing that you have information you can share and pass along. Because it could be that, you know, you're just held up in the hospital and somebody has to step in and take care of some things for you. So um, uh, Avis Pohl is going to do that program for us and um, is going to provide some really good resources for everyone. And just so everybody knows, within that flyer coming up, we are finally going to resume doing a couple trips this year. You know, we haven't done anything since October 2019, but we're going to do a day trip in June. We're going to go to Manning, Iowa. We're going to go to Templeton, to the distillery. We have a mystery stop. We're going to have a wonderful German lunch. And we have a new tour company we're working with. But all of that information will be included in, uh, in the next uh, mailing that you get at home with our upcoming programs. So thank you for coming out, everyone. Um, be careful out out there. Stay safe. Thanks for coming today. Once again, thank you, Crystal, and have a great day.